I think father must have 20 or 30 layers, and I think I've gotten down to maybe the seventh or eighth layer. And I think there's complexity in father that's, that, that is certainly, from my perspective, unexplored. Hi, Bridget. Good to see you again. Hey, good to see you. Hey, Anthony. Nice to see you. Hey, you doing well? It's good to see you. Hey, father. How you doing? I mean, you got to pick your methodology. <laughs> he simply brings an enthusiasm to everything that becomes infectious. <laughs> Along with this laugh <laughs> that uh, also captures your attention. <laughs> Karen, that's great. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, turn their ears into hamburger as much as possible. <laughs> you know, I love it here. I love these parents. You can't, you love the students. I mean, you, you get hooked. It's, it's a very infectious atmosphere here, and I'm going to miss it very, very, very much. Jesus! His energy is huge. I mean, you see him at basketball games, and, and you know, he's sitting over with the parents. You know, the students are all standing up, and they want everybody to stand, and, and he's the one standing up over there in his clerics, cheering. Pretty much, if everybody's cheering and going, yeah, you know, and it's and I'm on a home court, I know, you know, I clap too. Yeah. Ugly, but we'll take it. <laughs> Given a little uh, inspiration, I hope, to the students to to uh, follow the call of Christ for all of us to be disciples. So that's that's the basic message. Sometimes the opportunity is just to say a kind word to a little kid. Sometimes it's to say a, a word of consolation to somebody who is suffering. Sometimes it's to just share your faith where somebody just is, really doesn't have any idea that there is even a kingdom of God out there and that they're called into the unconditional love and joy of God. They have no idea and you just sort of blurt it out and you change a person's life. I mean, retreats and masses and all that, all attendance for those things has really gone through the roof since he came here, and he's really put, it, put that out there to show people that they can, uh, they can be Catholic and have fun and have a great life and really enjoy it. He walks around campus and his clerics, and he, he, he doesn't, he's not afraid to be Catholic. He's not afraid that he's a priest, and he's not afraid to be a Jesuit, and, and so he puts that out there and shows people that they can have fun while they do it. Bob Spitzer's classic. Bob always comes in with three points. The problem is with Bob's three points, there's always, you know, one to 50 subsections of each point. And he has so much energy. He has a way of wearing you out as he's going through, you know, subset 49 of uh, position number two. And then he refers back to position five of subset one. Three things to remember about a utilitarian. Number one. And he always talks about his three points, but I've learned something. You know, he puts six points into three points or nine points. <laughs> it's always three points, but if you look at it, you know, A, number one, A, B, C, two, A, B, C, but he always calls it his three points. And if I have two points, people will raise their hand and go, what's the third? If you aren't quick, the Spitzerian boviations will kind of wear you down or confuse you. So you tell them you're going to have three points, you give them the three points, and then you summarize it again, and they walk out of the room, they remember it. And he says everything with such confidence that how can you disagree with them? I must admit that within my three-point system, I love to have three sub-points for each of the points. In, in a lifetime, and I'm, I'm uh, 65 years old, so I've, I've had a lot, a lot of a lifetime, you're fortunate if you meet two or three geniuses in your lifetime, real geniuses, and certainly Father Spitzer is, is one of those two or three geniuses. I've been in the car with him. We're headed downtown to a, a luncheon where he's going to be the keynote speaker, and he's asking me questions like, okay, tell me what this is all about, and what's the topic, what do they want me to address, and just then walks in there with a few prep notes and just knocks it out of the park. So he, is, he has a real gift when it comes to speaking. Right here at Gonzaga University in 1974, I stopped trying to catalog how many factoids I learned. 
I stop trying to catalog the AICPA code. Do I have it all in my head? This is the value of my education. And I started thinking, oh, I got a gem. I got a self. I got a heart. That heart is so good. You can either have a comparative one or you can have a contributive one. And there is an instinct which comes out of this. And of course, if you're so lucky, and many of you will be. To see your eternal effects for all eternity. Sometime you could be giving a lecture on the general theory of relativity. I don't know. The decision to try and learn everything you can. To choose empathy is to choose a commitment. Those gifts of inspiration. And where we make up our minds that we're going to try and make a positive difference. You know, an optimal positive difference with our time, our talents, and our energies. And in all of that spiritual friendship, you will find a joy in Christ Jesus. And it builds friendships that last forever. I kid you not, I could be adopted by 100 families. It's a great life. I belong to the Mensa Society. What a great life I have lived. They love my chess game. But if that's it, it's travesty. Lovely in eyes and lovely in limbs, not his, to the Father, through the features of people's faces. Right? It just starts with that fascination with something. And the fascination grows to a, a deep interest. A deep interest grows to a kind of enchantment. The enchantment grows to the burning heart. And the burning heart is literally pointing us in a brand new and unexpected direction. That we want literally the world to be better off for our having lived and optimally better off for our having lived. And I promise you that you too will be adopted by a hundred different families to the culture and to the society around you because that really is the spirit of Gonzaga. He's a businessman, he's a philosopher, he's a mathematician, he's an accountant, he's a comedian, you know, I mean he's there are just all sorts of words that come to it, but I think the best single word is a visionary. Nobody saw Gonzaga any clearer and had any better vision than he did. Because he is such a visionary, he has golf term, things teed up there now for someone to come in who doesn't really have to start over again. Building a university, cleaning up a financial mess, we don't have any of that. He has a growth plan that is put in place that can serve us well for the next number of years. I think his legacy will survive long beyond his departure and it will not be measured by the buildings he built, but just by having elevated us in the minds of our faculty, our students, our donors as a really outstanding school on the West Coast. My legacy, I hope, uh, will be to have infused a spirit in this campus. The spirit that I gave them maybe at a mass or the spirit that I shared with them in a class or the inspiration that I tried to give in, in a speech. You know, that spirit, uh, first and foremost, is, is what I hope my legacy will be.